I'm Garen Davis MP for Swansea West. Um, I sit on the EFRA Select Committee. I've been author of a clean air bill, plastics bill, involved with the environment um, in the UK government and also on the Council of Europe. I'm here to talk briefly about uh, our challenges on the environment as we move forward outside Europe and opportunities as we move towards COP26 and the challenges from climate change. As a basic background, I'm sure people will be aware that uh, global temperatures have gone up something like one degree since the 19th century. But this isn't uniformly distributed, so the increase is something like um, 2% uh, over uh, Europe and 3% over the Arctic already. And what that means in practice is that as we speak, uh, 8,500 cubic tons, cubic meters, tons of ice are basically uh, melting per second in Greenland. And we also know that since Kyoto in 1990, global emissions are up 60%. Moreover, uh, by 2030, we'll have reached the one and a half degree tipping point. Um, for global emissions. So we're in a serious place and it's critically important that we have rules in place and incentives to deliver Paris Agreement compliance and I very much hope therefore that uh, the um, US elections pushes us in that, uh, that direction. In terms of Europe of course there's been an attempt to uh, have a regulatory framework with enforceable standards and limits to which have sanctions to deliver environmental outcomes. So in the case of air quality, for instance, uh, the UK has been taken to court on a number of occasions, now by client earth, for breaching EU air quality limits. Air quality uh, is massively important. Obviously, it's a byproduct of the fact that the, the world invests something like 6.5% of global GDP in fossil fuel subsidies or sort of paying our way into oblivion and part of that cost is the seven million people who die each year uh, from air pollution. In Britain the number is 64,000 according to the latest estimates now used by the Royal College of Physicians which are taken from a European uh, heart uh, survey which uses very rich data. And in, in addition, uh, something like 15% of the COVID deaths we're now suffering are attributed to air pollution. So that's about 6,000 deaths so far due to air pollution. And air pollution, something like 28% of air pollution is from diesel cars and the like. But also from, you know, dirty industry, agricultural emissions as well. So we need to tackle all these. And um, clearly air pollution is one uh, way that we can also help climate change as well. So um, changing the duty on diesel, um, thinking again about planning in terms of how we, far we travel, how often we travel, whether we really need to do that. And the advent of uh, a new tomorrow where we realize now we can do so much more work at home. If for example, we spent one day a week instead of five on average in at home working, then we reduce reduce the um, traffic levels proportionally, and the congestion levels disproportionately. Probably some eighty percent of congestion would be reduced by twenty percent reduction in traffic. So we do need to think very carefully about how we move forward. And one of those thoughts needs to be whether we put uh, specific limits uh, and standards into our regulations now that we're moving out of transition. In the case of uh, the negotiations with the EU, of course, the Canada deal that's been done with the EU has what's called non-regression clauses in it, which means that standards uh, will not go below the EU standards. Uh, I'm very much in, think that our own uh, withdrawal agreement and trade agreement with the EU should have regression clauses in order that we don't slip below their standards and we can exceed them. There's no reason to do otherwise unless one expects or wants to go beneath them. And sadly, in the case of air quality, 
uh, the government and the environment bill, which is going through Parliament as we speak, um, is planning to only set targets in 2022, and those targets would be set by the Secretary of State. Those targets would not be legally enforceable and binding. And what's more, they could be changed if the Secretary of State thought he or she wanted to. Uh, what's more, they're looking at uh, air pollution, which is uh, basically average air pollution. In other words, you can get highly uh, dense pollution in poor, obviously poorer neighbourhoods with uh, more diverse communities that suffer much worse. Uh, clearly, if you want to stop that, we need universal, uh, legally enforceable air quality standards. And that's why we need to build those into the Environment Bill. And indeed, we need um, food standards built into the Agriculture Bill and our Trading Bill, because clearly, otherwise, uh, the fear and the expectation is, uh, most specifically, that we'll end up with foods that we wouldn't normally expect, certainly from the EU, and that might in turn as well uh, impact on our relationship with the EU if they thought we were trying to smuggle in hormone impregnated beef or chlorinated chicken. There are problems with, incidentally, with hormone impregnated beef in particular. Uh, they give rise to premature puberty amongst children, by way of example. So it is important to have these standards so that our uh, producers, whether agricultural or manufacturing, in other ways, um, to produce things to the highest and impr increasing environmental standards uh, with an eye towards climate change. And certainly my view, and something I'm pushing forward in the Council of Europe, that the future template for trade agreements should include um, a compliance with uh, a Paris Agreement as well as basic human rights, democracy and rule of law uh, constraints uh, as well. Um, in terms of the balance as we move forward between economic and environmental needs, um, I think it's very important to look at the environment as an economic opportunity, not as a, not as a trade-off. Because as the world realises, and we all do hopefully, that we need uh, Paris Agreement compliance or better for global sustainability of humankind to avoid you know, drought and flooding and mass migration, war, conflict and, and death, um, then over time I assume the markets will realise that some assets in fossil fuel and the like are stranded assets and that the future economy will be driven by green products, which is another reason as I was mentioning, to have uh, strict guidelines in order to spark innovation that builds uh, an export capability. Uh, incidentally, on the financial side, uh, the UK spends something about £20 billion a year on unclean air in terms of health costs and lack of productivity. If we had a Clean Air Act or a proper environment bill with proper World Health Organization standards, by which I mean, incidentally, 10 micrograms per cubic metre of PM 2.5 delivered by 2030, uh, then we would probably reduce that cost at 20 billion. And if we only reduced it to, say, 17 billion and, say, 3 billion a year, uh, 3 billion a year, at interest rates below 1% of the government, would fund infrastructure and green manufacturing of something like 300 billion pounds, or more than that, in fact. And uh, bear in mind that we spent 200 billion so far on COVID. So it is possible to, to pay back large investments to actually re-gear our uh, industrial base on a green platform for growth in products that other people want to buy because they will want to participate in, in a green future. And in Wales, where I'm sitting, as you can guess from the flag behind me, um, the investments in to support uh, industry are largely um, done on the basis of the three tick boxes, which is, are you part of a some growth future? Are you part of uh, a carbon, moving towards a carbon neutral future? And are you inclusive? Are you helping, you know, the regional or local community economically? These are considerations that are made and I support. Um, so in the case, of course, of supporting British Steel in South Wales, by way of example, or Airbus in 
in North Wales. Um, obviously, it's often thought that these industries aren't helpful towards uh, you know um, the climate, but in fact, the, the steel producers in Tata are producing steel that you can put around houses, cladding that then produces its own energy. Um, uh, Airbus are looking at uh, new carbon wings, etc. So these industries do need to adapt to a future where the environment is central to our economic uh, planning. Moving on to then, um, uh, I, I, I hope I made it clear that I don't see there's uh, many benefits from us to sort of loosening our regulations and our laws on the environment, either for the economy or for trade or for the environment. But sadly, that's the direction of travel at, at the moment. But um, moving on to the opportunities for COP26, looking at the the uh, what we do need to do, is, of course, is to take a um, you know take the lead in the sort of areas I've talked about. Also, we need to do something on plastics. That would include a plastics tax on virgin plastics. So it simply lifted the price of plastic to encourage people to invest and consume uh, sustainable alternatives. It's um, not rocket science. But that's what needs to be done in possibly a differentiated tax regime, which um, was uh, more favourable towards more uh, recyclable plastics. Um, in terms of the, the wider picture, people need to be aware that um, it's no good saying, oh, we've re reduced our carbon emissions in Britain uh, on the basis that we've exported our manufacturing offshore and closed all our coal mines alone. In particular, if we then consume the same products uh, from elsewhere, which are using coal in particular to produce them. So um, there is a case for, in theory, for a sort of global uh, fund, carbon fund, into which those people who, those countries which produced more carbon per head on average globally paid in and those less uh, got out um, and the money coming out would be for investment in in green infrastructure. These things are easier said than done to be facilitated by the UN. It's certainly something that should be a centre of conversation in COP26. But in the meantime, we need to think about having fiscal mechanisms, um, and obviously people will be familiar with carbon trading, but fiscal me mechanisms um, in uh, future trade agreements that encourage uh, green production and penalise emissions. Um, I think I'll probably leave it there other than to say uh, I'm not a great fan of fracking because uh, fracking, 5% of the methane from fracking is emitted uh, in leaks in um, fugitive emissions as they're known and, and uh, methane is 85 times worse than carbon dioxide for global warming which is worse than coal. So uh, there are opportunities ahead, we need to get on with it, we need to be honest and put the economy and the environment at the center of our economy as we move forward. Thank you very much.